One of the goals of the African Bird Fair is to promote birding across the continent. Each year, we have featured various countries. This year, we have three features. First up is Dylan Vasapoli of Birding Eco Tours talking about Mozambique. Then, Dr. Daniel Dankowitz of Rock Jumper Birding Tours on Kenya. And then last but not least, Dr. Callan Cohen of Birding Africa, who will feature Gabon. Day to you all. I'm Dylan Vasapoli working for Birding Eco Tours. And today I'm going to be talking to you all about Mozambique, birding off the beaten track. Mozambique is one of the sadly um, infrequently visited countries in Southeast Africa. And it is, a, it is a real big shame. You know, it's perhaps most famous for its wonderful subtropical beaches. You know, these beautiful palm lined um, sort of resorts with glorious blue oceans and lovely warm water. So Mozambique's tourism traditionally stems from this uh, beach culture. And it's, um, its birding and its wildlife potential has long been overlooked, which is um, a, real, a real big shame because Mozambique, you know, it's a, it's a massive country and it has a wide diversity of sites and as, as a result, wide diversity of sites and diversity of habitats also ensures that it has a huge number of bird species that occur in this country. So um, we, uh, here today and during this talk, we're gonna run through some of the um, core birding sites and birding regions. Sadly, we don't have enough time to go through each of the sites in a great amount of detail. So we've lumped the sites into sort of broader categories and we're gonna go through some of these effectively broader sites and then look at some of the, the core and the key bird species that occur within these sites. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of a heads up as to what we're gonna be talking about today. But without further ado, um, let us begin. So we're now gonna look at a, a brief history on Mozambique. So Mozambique, like unfortunately many African countries has a somewhat unfortunate past. After Mozambique um, you know, gained its independence, um, it unfortunately went into a long and protracted civil war. And it only recently ended you know, in, in terms of greater history um, during the late 1990s, that sort of peace and stability come to the region. Unfortunately, this you know, long civil war left the country effectively crippled. You know, infrastructure was um, non-existent, buildings were run down, and um, also you know, uh, many of them were broken down. And, you know, the, the wildlife as well was sort of totally devastated just with this long civil war. So it is a, it's a great shame. And another one of the, the major um, factors about Mozambique that initially hampered a lot of the early tourism was the fact that guerrilla warfare was used during the civil war. And this meant that landmines were, were very widespread throughout the country. So, of course, you know, that was a, a major factor in, in birding um, tourism and sort of tourism generally to the country. You know, you don't want to risk landmines as part of your travel. So we, we can now fortunately say that the landmines have been 100% cleared out um, throughout the country. So landmines no longer pose a risk um, to travelers in Mozambique. But, you know, it has obviously taken some, it did take some time to, to get to that stage. So anyway, just dealing with it a little bit more, you know, Mozambique is a is a large country, as we briefly touched on. So it's uh, it covers several thousand kilometers along the southeast African coastline, you know, effectively stretching from, you know, southern Africa, pretty far down the continent up to, you know, Tanzania, which is, you know, not terribly far off the equator. So it's uh, it covers a substantial um, period, like a substantial ground um, within, the, within the, the continent. Um, so the bulk of the population is centered on the southern and the central regions of Mozambique. And, you know, this is obviously where the main tourism focus um, has been achieved. This is, these are the areas where the infrastructure, uh, infrastructural capabilities have been built up. And it's also where, you know, lodges and game reserves have been established with um, reintroduction programs and all of these things. So the, the main, focus of our talk as well is going to be on the southern and central Mozambique region. Um, another one of the, the factors contributing to this is that this um, southern and central region of Mozambique um, has been lumped into the southern African sub-region, which is widely used amongst birders in South Africa and 
you know, within the Southern African sub-region, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Botswana. So these, this area has, you know, arguably also received the bulk of the attention um, with Northern Mozambique being far more rural and far more um, difficult to access. So uh, that destination has unfortunately um, not been birded as extensively as the Southern and Central Mozambique regions. Um, which is uh, also slightly unfortunate, you know, there's some wonderful birds possible up there and we're going to touch on them very briefly at the end of this talk. But for the purposes of this talk, we're just focusing on the southern and central regions. And then lastly, um, we are just going to sort of reconfirm, you know, that Mozambique has immense birding potential. There are a wide variety of excellent birding sites that cover a wide diversity of habitats. Um, some of the most pristine Miombo woodland patches that I've ever seen exist in, in Mozambique along with, you know, high, high elevation, montane sort of tropical forests down to sort of these vast and verdant subtropical wetlands and inundated grasslands. Um, and then, you know, we also have these um, vast and massive lowland forest patches that also host another whole suite of different species. So, yeah, we've just briefly touched on that, you know, all these different habitat types bring in a widely diverse array of species. And um, another one of the core factors that make Mozambique so important is that many of these species are highly localized and have very limited world ranges. You know, so Mozambique's a very important country for the world birder. It gives you access to a lot of these birds that occur in remote parts of Malawi and Zambia and southern Tanzania and such, you know, that are all very difficult and very tricky to access. So they are actually all quite um, feasible, you know, in the southern and central parts of Mozambique. So it's a destination that is um, well worth uh, traveling to and exploring, you know, for, for any world birder. So here we just have a rough map of Mozambique showing you all where it is in the greater scheme of the continent. Should you not be aware, it's obviously the red highlighted country in the southeast corner there. And here we just have another map of Mozambique, you know, with the green shaded in portions. You can see some of the major cities with the red dots. Maputo is obviously the capital in the south of the country. And then you can see some of the major rivers as well. So here you can just see a bit more clearly the section of Mozambique that we're dealing with. The, the section that's obviously highlighted in orange here, south of the Zambezi River. This is what is lumped into the Southern African sub-region. And this is the, the region that we, this, that we refer to as Southern and Central Mozambique. So we're going to start off with um, the broader Southern Mozambique region. This is obviously a pretty broad region, as you'll see with the map that we're going to view shortly. It covers a um, substantial amount of ground in the greater Southern Mozambique area. And we deal with a wide variety of sites like the, the Makanita, you know, coastal floodplains and coastal grasslands that occur in the very Southern Mozambique near Maputo. And there's also several similar sites that deal with a similar habitat set. And then we progress into, um, you know, these rich Miomba woodlands, which you can see in this photograph here, outside the small rural village of Panda, um, that also hosts some very important bird species. And then moving slightly further up the coast, we have these denser areas of sort of coastal thickets and coastal forests that host another set of um, sought after species. So these are the main sites that we're going to be dealing with in southern Mozambique. Here is just a map showing you, um, again, the section highlighted in orange that we're roughly working with here. So first off, starting within the coastal grasslands and floodplains, um, this is rosy-throated longclaw, as you can see here. This is a nice male. And this is one of the, the core species and targets in this region. This region of southern Mozambique, of course, also shares uh, a number of these east coast littoral endemics, which um, are effectively these bird species that occur in parts of Zululand in northern South Africa and various parts of sort of southern Mozambique. This pink throated twin spot is one of these core east coast littoral endemics that also have uh, ranges in southern Mozambique. The delightful Les Jacana is one of the other sort of tropical wetland species that occurs in this region. And uh, wetlands in this region have also proved reliable for the Eurasian bittern. 
this is a um, another highly sought after species for you know southern african birders and birders right throughout the world and it's um, it's excellent that you know these these sites that are proving reliable for this highly sought after species. Then moving into also more some of the woodland species, pale batis, formerly known as Mozambique batis, is another one of the species we look for here. And olive-headed weaver is arguably one of the most important targets in the woodlands, more specifically in the Nyamba woodlands around Panda, where the species has a highly fragmented and highly isolated population. Um, its nearest known population is up in central Malawi, also, you know, um, several thousand kilometers away. White-breasted cuckoo shrike is another species that occurs in these woodlands, as does the wonderful racket-tailed roller. Neogard sunbird is another one of these east coast littoral endemics, like the pink throated tunspot we spoke about a bit earlier, that occurs in southern Mozambique. Gorgeous bushrike is another um, key species in the, the thickets and um, wooded patches of southern Mozambique. And green tinkerbird also has a peculiar history with specimens discovered in the late 1900s and um, of the species from southern Mozambique, but no confirmed sightings, you know, for many decades until several um, intrepid birders actually went, up, went out in 2013 to rediscover this local southern Mozambique population of the species. And they were actually successful, you know, they rediscovered this population of green tinkerbird in southern Mozambique. Again, um, you know, horribly isolated with its nearest populations occurring up in northern uh, Mozambique, again, several thousand kilometers away. So it was, um, you know, these birds have now become accessible within the southern African subregion, which is um, excellent for many birders. Livingston's flycatcher is another one of the um, really delightful species that we look for in these denser woodland patches. And now we move on to coastal Mozambique. So this is a very typical scene in coastal Mozambique. You know, the, there's a large number of various mudflats and estuarine regions that bring in many hundreds and thousands of shorebirds. So this is a very typical scene um, comprised of three of the, the main species within these regions. Lesser sand plover, sandling, and curlew sandpiper. Those three species occur also in vast numbers or across many of the wetlands and coastal sort of mudflats in Mozambique. And um, some of the core main areas we're going to be focusing on, there are several mudflats outside of Maputo, um, but we also be focusing ourselves more on the Inhamban estuaries and then the, the vast um, estuaries and mudflats of the um, San Sebastian Peninsula and the Bazarutu Island archipelago. So just showing you again, you can see the region um, in this orange highlighted section here that we're focusing on, on sort of coastal Mozambique in the southern Mozambique region. So aside from the species that we mentioned in the earlier intro slide, one of the species that has put this um, area on the map and more specifically the San Sebastian Peninsula and the Bazarutu Archipelago has been the discovery of Saunders Tern in the region, as you can see with the center frame species. Um, this is a, a very tricky bird that a, a has a fairly wide worldwide distribution uh, throughout the east coast of Africa and into the sort of Arabian Peninsula area, but they're very tricky and very difficult pretty much everywhere in their range. So to find these uh, the species regularly off the um, San Sebastian Peninsula has been um, a major tourism boost to that specific region. Of course, uh, crab plovers are arguably the, the country's uh, most famous coastal shorebird, and indeed Mozambique is a wonderful place to get to grips with this highly sought after species. Just another photo showing the, the birds in situ on their beach of choice. Olive bee eater or Madagascar bee eater, as it's also referred to, is um, common along this coastal Mozambique area. We then move on to one of the most exciting birding regions in, in Mozambique, and this is we refer to as the Western Highlands. Um, it's contiguous with the, the more famous Eastern Highlands in Zimbabwe. You know, I'm sure many folks are familiar with the birding around Seldom Seen and the Vumba and the Nyanga area. Um, but obviously, you know, this Eastern Highland, this very famous Eastern Highland region of Zimbabwe, obviously sort of straddles the Mozambique border as well in Western Mozambique. 
and you know it has the exactly the same habitats arguably some some habitats that are better you know there's vast patches of forest and immense um, sections of yomba woodland habitat arguably superior to those that occur in zimbabwe and this region also has the full suit of these species that occur here so here you can again just see the region we're referring to highlighted in orange on the western section of sort of central Mozambique bordering with Zimbabwe. Some of the, the, the best and the most mature patches of Miombo woodland I've ever seen have been in this area in the Chimani Mani National Park in Mozambique. And um, African spotted creeper is one of the many really great birds that are that one looks for in this, this area. And the cinnamon breasted tit is another core in uh, species that we look for in these Miombo woodlands. As its name suggests, Miombo rock thrush is another denizen of these, uh, these, these regions. As is the delightful green-backed honeybird, another sort of the species. And then moving away from the Miombo woodlands, which largely occur in the foothills, we progress higher up these mountains and we go into patches of um, high elevation montane forest. And here we get the full suit of, um, you know, the typical Zimbabwe Vumba birds that we're all familiar with starting with the Chiringa apelis. They're also um, very common up in this region, as is striped-cheeked greenbull, Roberts's warbler, red-faced crimson wing, and bronzy sunbird on some, some of the flowering sections. We then um, pull ourselves away from these wonderful western highlands of Mozambique and we go towards the coastal um, Rio Savan floodplains. This is effectively the region from Baira on the coast at the mouth of the Pungwe River um, up to the, the mouth of the Zambezi um, River um, a bit further to, to the north. There's this vast sections of coastal floodplains similar to what you can see in this photograph. This is just showing you all where we're dealing with. You can obviously see the area highlighted in orange near Baira in the central part of Mozambique. Dickinson's kestrel is one of many exciting raptors that occur in these more open floodplain areas. And this is a great area to get to grips with a lot of Africa's difficult um, floodplain species, like this wonderful locust finch. Lesser sea cracker is another one of the highly sought after species that occurs in this region. This is a very difficult and very nomadic species, but this re the greater Rio Savan area and these floodplains and thickets are a wonderful area to search for this highly sought after species. Blue quail is another one of the um, highly sought after targets that occur in these sort of flooded, temporarily flooded coastal grasslands. As is great snipe, another highly sought after species. So we then pull ourselves away from these, those wonderful coastal floodplains around Baira and the Rio Saban area and we move slightly inland to the Gorongosa region. And here we deal with two primary sites, Gorongosa Mountain and the nearby um, Gorongosa National Park, which is centered on the um, Urima Lake, as you can see in this photograph here. Just to show you all the region we're dealing with, we're now still in the central Mozambique area highlighted in orange um, near the town of Chimoyo. Green-headed oriole is one of the, um, the many exciting birds that occur on Mount Gorongosa, and this is the only southern African site for this um, sought after species. Unfortunately, the mountain has been inaccessible for several years now due to some political instability, but um, at some stage we hope that the mountain will become accessible again and birders can head up to the forests and look for this green-headed oriole. Moving away from the mountain, where the oriole is the main target, we move back down into the Gorongosa National Park and we focus ourselves on the floodplains and woodlands around the Urima Lake. An African skimmer is one of many sought after birds that occur on the lake. Red winged prinia, formerly known as red winged warbler, is one of the many species that occur in the woodland areas away from the lake. As is speckle throated woodpecker, African emerald cuckoo. Miombo blue-eared starling and the lovely broad-tailed paradise wider. 
The last region that we're going to have a proper look at is the, the Greater Zambezi Delta region. Um, this is, a, again, a fairly broad region stemming out of the town of Kaya on the Zambezi River. It, it incorporates a wide range of floodplain habitats associated with the actual Zambezi River, and then these vast and massive lowland forest patches, which you can see in this photograph here, some that hold some of the most exciting birding in the region. Again, just showing you in orange where we're looking at, south of the Zambezi River. African pitta is one of the core and main targets that occur in this broader Zambezi River Valley area, and you search for these in the lowland forests. White-chested alethi is another highly sought-after skulker um, that occurs in these lowland forests. While flocks of noisy chestnut fronted helmet trikes flop ahead with their lazy flights. East Coast Accolat is another notorious skulker of these lowland forest thickets. While African broadbill give their noisy um, display from some of the denser stands of thickets in these forests. This is area also hosts a curious population of mangrove kingfishers. Um, somewhat different to the rest of the species population that occur in mangroves along um, coastal African um, regions. So here you get them in the lowland forest patches well away from the coast. The ever likable Narina trogon is another species that occurs in these forest patches. While some of the woodland areas around the forests host Zambezi indigo bird. African hobby is another bird to look for in the woodland surrounding the forests as is the incredible Suti falcon. The Zambezi River itself hosts um, a population of Bohm's bee eater. Again, um, the small village of Villa de Sena, north of Kaya, is the only region within southern Africa where birders can see this glorious bee eater. While moustache grass warbler is another more common resident of the floodplains associated with the Zambezi River. This is also a great area to see the unique bone spine tail as they fly over um, sort of woodlands within this region. So where does this leave us with Northern Mozambique, the area highlighted in orange on this map? As you can see, this is also quite a, a broad area and it covers um, some immense ground. And it's, a, it's very unfortunate that birders have largely um, ignored this, this region because it does hold some incredible bird species. You know, uh, for example, Mozambique's only endemic bird, the Namuli apelus, occurs in this region on Mount Namuli, which you can see on this map as well here, just above the actual Mozambique portion. And um, unfortunately, this area is just very remote and it's the infrastructural developments have been um, are far less than in sort of southern and central Mozambique, where the bulk of the infrastructural upgrades and developments have been focused. So this whole northern Mozambique area is just a little bit more difficult to access. Birders usually need to be self-sufficient um, and the sites are also more difficult to access, often, often requiring long hikes um, to get to your destinations. You know, roads are not, um, not present or not maintained. And, you know, and it's, it's a great shame because even, you know, Mozambique's only endemic bird, Namuli Apolis, it occurs in such a remote and rural region that so few international birders have even seen this bird. Um, so it is a, it's, it's a great shame. So there's, there is a large, a huge uh, potential for birding in this um, northern Mozambique region. But for now, it probably requires the more adventurous birders who don't mind roughing it and winging it in some of sort of the most rural parts of Africa to be able to get into this area and properly explore. There's also um, Similar other mountains north of Mount, Nam Mount Namuli um, that are host some exciting species on the NJC plateau. There's um, a lot of unique species from southern Tanzania and northern Malawi that creep into these areas. Things like um, spot throat and um, some of the forest warblers, all other highly exciting denizens that await birders that visit this northern Mo Mozambique region. Well, that's brought us to the end of this um, wonderful talk on birding in Mozambique. I, again, I'm Dylan Vassipoli working for Birding Eager Tours, and um, we do have a virtual booth for the, this virtual African bird fair. Please do have a look at us, um, and you can see more about our tours to Mozambique 
and more about birding in this fantastic country. Please do feel free to email me with any questions or thoughts you might have. I'll definitely be keen to hear from you all. And we look forward to either welcoming you to Mozambique on one of our tours, or just to um, you getting to Mozambique yourself and exploring um, the wonders of this beautiful country. Thanks and cheers for now. Hi there everyone, and thank you for tuning into this session at the Virtual African Bird Fair. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here today representing Rock Jumper Burning Tours, and today I'm going to be sharing a bit of background about one of my absolute favourite African birding destinations, Kenya. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it, but just before we get to Kenya, if you'll allow me just a few minutes to speak about Rock Jumper. As a company, we run more than 300 tours a year to over 150 destinations worldwide, including tours to all seven continents. Each and every year, we see an excess of about 7,000 bird species across all of our tours, not to mention a countless number of mammals and other highlights. We seek to deliver the absolute ultimate in birding experiences, ensuring that all of our tours are seamlessly arranged, that they're fun and educational, but also that they support local conservation initiatives, something that we believe very strongly in. So contact us today if you too would like to join one of our upcoming adventures. Now, since joining Rock Jump as a permanent tour leader back in 2018, I've had the extreme fortune of guiding tours to countries all across Africa and Asia. So to say that Kenya has been one of my absolute favorite destinations thus far is really saying something. I visited Kenya for the first time earlier this year, and the country completely blew me away for the expanse of its protected reserves and the fact that you see people coexisting with wildlife, the sheer diversity of birds and mammals, but also the ease with which you see many of your targets. Kenya truly is Africa's ultimate safari destination. But let's take a step back and ask ourselves the question, where is Kenya for the purposes of those who may not know? And what makes Kenya so special? Well, Kenya is located in equatorial East Africa, below the Horn of Africa. It neighbours Uganda to the west, South Sudan, Ethiopia and Somalia to the north, and Tanzania to the south. To the east, Kenya is flanked by a relatively short coastline that meets the Indian Ocean, and the Indian Ocean is core to regulating the climate within Kenya. Now, climatic variation, together with the variable topography across the entire country, has resulted in extremely rich habitat diversity. And if we take a short tour of some of the habitats that you may expect to encounter on a standard visit to Kenya, the tropical Western Indian Ocean has a profound influence on the coastal regions of Kenya, as is clearly seen by the narrow green strip that extends from the southern border with Tanzania all the way to the northern border with Somalia. In the very south, we have the Taita Hills, which are some of the richest montane forests in all of Kenya, forming the northern flank of the eastern Ark Mountains further to the south in Tanzania. Heading north still towards Somalia, we move into an area of dry coastal savanna, and in this area we see a number of dry, deciduous woodlands and thickets, including the famed Arabuka Sokoki Forest. Now, altogether, this region has been inscribed by UNESCO as a biodiversity hotspot, hosting varied endemic wildlife, as well as a myriad of unique and endemic flora. As one moves further inland, the habitat becomes progressively drier, and just a short distance from the coast, one enters an expanse of dry acacia woodlands. Now, these parts are quite clearly seen in the satellite image that you can see on your screens now, notably the areas that appear browner in colour. This also means that as little as 50 kilometres inland from the coast, one sees a completely different habitat and with it comes a completely different assemblage of birds and mammals. Now, some of the core birds that you may be looking for in these dryland areas include the Somali bee-eater, Somali bunting, and Somali corsa, 
And as their name suggests, many of these birds are more charism uh, characteristic of regions further to the north. Further inland yet, the central plateau drops off steeply into the East African Rift Valley system. Now here altitude drops dramatically and the rich lowlands support a plethora of interesting habitats, which in turn support a bounty of unique species. In the very southwest of the country, Kenya flanks Lake Victoria. To the north, Lake Turkana, two of Africa's largest inland water bodies. But throughout these western parts of the country, we see a series of volcanic crater lakes linked to the Rift Valley system, and each of these lakes are unique in their own right. Some of these lakes support breathtaking numbers of both lesser and greater flamingos, but most of these lakes are important wintering sites for, the, for resident and for migratory waterfowl. Now the Kenyan lake system of the geologically dramatic Great Rift Valley system has also been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And finally, in South Central Kenya, there are a number of highland areas, including Mount Kenya, which you see on the upper right hand panel of your screen, Africa's second tallest mountain peak, reaching a lofty summit of 5,200 meters above sea level, equating to roughly 17,000 feet. Further to the south, of course, we have Mount Kilimanjaro at a lofty 5,895 meters above sea level, or roughly 19,300 feet. Now, although the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro is actually in neighboring Tanzania, the lower slopes of these mountains are incredibly rich, and most of them are blanketed in rich montane forests, while the highland areas support alpine meadows, grasslands, and even a glacier. So it's the climatic and topographical variation in Kenya that lends itself towards this incredibly high habitat diversity, and in turn it's the habitat diversity that supports an extremely high number of both birds and mammals. It's no surprise then that from a birding perspective, Kenya boasts one of the largest bird lists of any African country, amounting to 1,078 species, including 10 endemic species and roughly 17 near-endemic species. A burgeoning service industry continues to grow in Kenya, and ecotourism plays a vital role in East Africa's strongest economy. Visitors flock to the country to see Africa's Big Five, but also to pay witness to the Great Migration. And it's unsurprising then that the country boasts some of the largest intact protected wilderness areas. And top among these are the Masai Mara Game Reserve and the Savo West and Savo East National Parks. As a safari destination, Kenya is perhaps most well known for the Great Migration, a natural phenomenon whereby one and a half million wildebeest, 400,000 plain zebra, and 300 Thompsons and Grants Gazelle migrate between the Serengeti in neighboring Tanzania and the Masai Mara in Kenya. Now you may not know this, but this migration is actually an ongoing process in that the herds are so incredibly large that the animals have to keep moving in order to survive. Considered by many to be one of the most thrilling wildlife spectacles, the herds travel 800 kilometers in a clockwise direction through the Serengeti and Masai Mara ecosystems in search of greener, mineral-rich pastures and water. With these incredible herds of plains game come an abundance of predators, and animals such as lion, spotted hyena, and cheetah are all relatively easy to see in Kenya. In fact, to speak from personal experience, in just three weeks spent in Kenya earlier this year, we managed to see in the region of about 40 individual cheetah at various sites throughout the country. But Kenya is also particularly well known for some of Africa's lesser known and perhaps less charismatic predators, including the serval. Further to the north, Kenya plays host to some of Africa's most beautiful mammal species, 
And top among these are the Grevy's zebra, the largest of all of the zebras, and the sensational reticulated giraffe. Now both of these mammals are highly threatened, but Kenya supports 70% of the world's remaining Grevy zebra populations, as well as 2,000 of the remaining reticulated giraffes. These same northern areas also play host to some of the most unusual mammals on the African continent, including the giraffe-like Geronuk with a strangely elongate body, and the Gunther's Dictic. But enough about the mammals, let's take a look at some of the birds that are possible in Kenya. Many of the bird groups that you expect to encounter throughout Kenya's open savanna ecosystems will be familiar to you, and this includes a wonderful selection of starlings. Starlings are common throughout Kenya, but they truly are some of the most spectacular bird species, and some of the species that you expect to see in Kenya include the absolutely sensational golden-breasted starling, this aptly named superb starling, which is one of Kenya's most common birds. It's scarce a cousin, the Hildebrand starling, which is fairly regularly seen within the Maasai Mara, and then the widespread greater blue-eared starling. Then of course we have the bee-eaters, the barbets, hornbills, and a huge diversity of seed-eaters, including some really interesting finches, waxbills, widers, and weavers. On the screen you will see a white-throated bee-eater, a Daanet barbet, von der Decken's hornbill, and a straw-tailed wider. Sticking with the savanna ecosystems, there's a number of scarcer bird species that typically require a lot more time spent searching. These include the Somali corsa, an incredibly pale colored corsa, one of the smaller corsa species. And this is a really iconic bird of some of the drier areas in Kenya, such as in the north at Samburu Shaba and Buffalo Springs, but the species is also possible in the Sava reserves. Bustards are incredibly common. This particular individual is a buff-crested bustard. And I also, with this image, want to draw your attention to these incredibly rich red soils that you can see in this image. This is a very iconic feature of southeastern Kenya and a really iconic part of the Savo landscape. One of my absolute favorite birds in all of Kenya was the vulturine guinea fowl, a truly sensational species. And this guinea fowl becomes, th becomes the default guinea fowl in certain parts of the country, a bird that few images can do proper justice to. And then of course the sand grouse are a fairly common feature throughout, and this particular bird is the black-faced sand grouse. As you might expect, given the expanse of protected reserves within Kenya, birds of prey occur at an extremely high density. Marshall Eagle, one of Africa's largest eagles, is a regular sight throughout the country, especially within the larger protected reserves of the Maasai Mara and Sava. In terms of its size, to completely contrast from the Marshall Eagle, the pygmy falcon, one of uh, the world's smallest bird of prey species, is also a fairly common sight at a few places within Kenya. And for those who may not be too familiar with the species, the pygmy falcon nests in association with several species of weaver, and it actually takes over one of the weaver's nests for breeding and roosting purposes. So these birds are little bigger than a weaver. East Africa's default bird of prey is then the eastern chanting goshawk with its beautiful bright yellow sear contrasting from the yellow legs, and this species is quite similar to the grasshopper buzzard, which is a seasonal visitor to Kenya. Moving from the savanna ecosystems to the neighboring grassland ecosystems, you would be lucky to see several species of longclaw, and top among them is the sharp's longclaw, a species entirely restricted and endemic to the central highland plateau of Kenya. Another characteristic bird species of the Kenyan grasslands is the grey-crowned crane, and at virtually every single wetland within Kenya, you stand an excellent chance of seeing pairs of these incredibly regal birds um, parading about. 
One of the more uh, localized and sought after bird species is the Jackson's Widow Bird, a bird that's been forever mortalized by those incredible documentary series highlighting their breeding displays. These birds congregate at leks and the males, pictured here in the lower left hand panel, jump a meter above the, the grass with their tails all flared out in the hopes of attracting a suitable mate. This bird is quite readily seen in the Maasai Mara, but tends to move into these areas uh, immediately after rain, and so it is one of the more challenging species that you uh, will be looking for in Kenya. And then of course a bird that everybody wants to see, putting all other pipits to shame, we have the golden pipit. Once again, this bird is quite nomadic in nature, but there are several sites within the country where these birds are easily seen. You would also want to plan some time to visit some of the forest sites within the country, and three of the top sites that come to mind include the Taita Hills down in the very southeast, Kakamega Forest in the west near the border with Uganda, and the forests around the foothills of Mount Kenya. Now each of these forests supports a wealth of interesting species, but perhaps the three most sought after forest species in Kenya are the three Taita endemics the critically endangered Taita thrush and Taita palus, as well as the Taita white eye. Now the Taita white eye is the white eye with the broadest white eye ring of any white eye in the world, and although this isn't the species pictured here, white eyes in general have proliferated throughout the forests of East Africa, and this is one of the most common bird groups that you will expect to encounter when visiting these forested sites, together of course with the green bulls. Down in the very southeast of the country, there are also a number of incredibly dry deciduous forests, including the Shire Hills Forest Reserve, and these sites play host to some incredibly localized bird species, including the Uluguru violet-backed sunbird, as well as the incredibly range-restricted and notoriously difficult green-headed oriole. All of these forest sites then support a wealth of different sunbird species, and perhaps the top among them is the Takazi sunbird, with highlights of bronze and purple in its plumage, and this incredibly long tail. Now thankfully many of these species are readily seen today, so um, are quite easily added to any trip to Kenya. I thought there was no better way to end my talk this afternoon than to show you a picture of this bird, the Sokoki scops owl. Africa's smallest owl species. Restricted to just three forests in East Africa, including the Arabuka Sokoki forest in southeast Kenya, this species is arguably Africa's cutest bird. The species occurs in two distinct color morphs, the gray morph and the rich rufous morph that you can see in this image here. And if you're very lucky when visiting this forest, you stand a chance at seeing these birds on a day roost, and often the two color morphs are, can be seen side by side. The Arabuka Sokoki forest, after which the species was named, is home to several other endemic birds, including the Amani sunbird, as well as the Clark's weaver. And this is an absolute must-visit stop on any tour to Kenya. So that's all from me today. I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed my talk and I hope you enjoy the rest of the virtual African bird fair this year. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have and thank you very much for tuning into this session. Hi, my name is uh, Callan Cohen and I'm from the tour company Birding Africa and I'm going to try and give you some of my impressions and an introduction to the birding in the Central African country of Gabon. I've been traveling to Gabon in the Central African region for many years um, and it's a place that I really enjoy birding and it's got some fantastic birds. So let me try in this brief time to give you an introduction to what I think are some of the better ones and what are some of the more interesting areas to explore to give you a sense of how to plan and think about a trip there. So firstly I'd like to thank for these photographs in this trip. These are all these pics I've taken by Paul Noakes and Jonathan Newman uh, on the the last year's Birding Africa tour to Gabon. Really appreciate them letting me letting us use these pics. Um, they're really, really superb. So thank you for that. Um, Jonathan has also just seen his 9,000 species of world bird in Uganda a few days ago, a ruins Auriapolis. So yeah, 
was very much at the forefront of, of, of world birding. And um, perhaps one of the most famous birds in Gabon that I probably need to introduce you to right at the very beginning is the African river martin. You can see it here in the background of this photograph. Um, it's, you know, a martin, a type of swallow, uh, really fantastically striking sort of, you know, matte black bird, bright red eye, bright orange bill and orange feet. And it's a really special migrant that migrates um, from a very dispersed area, you know, in the Congo Basin um, to breed on the Gabon coast. And uh, it's uh, certainly one of Gabon's most charismatic birds and a bird that, um, that one doesn't often hear about if one doesn't know about the birds of Central Africa. And just to give you an idea as to how really striking it is, like here is a close-up picture taken on, on our tour last September, October. And you can just see how kind of dazzling it is with those bright, really orange eyes and bright orange bull. And it's so famous that um, BirdLife South Africa have actually made a stuffed toy of it. Seems a pretty good resemblance, although this is actually rocky the African black oyster catcher stuffed toy, but you could easily be forgiven for thinking it was an African river martin with the, these bright little orange feet, amazing eyes and bright orange bull. So anyway, um, as tempted as I was to have Rocky do the rest of the talk, I think I'll put him down for now and uh, try and get you, give you some more info about like how best to think about Gabon. So Gabon, um, if, if you see there, um, let me get my pointer in there. Can you see there Gabon is very much in the, on the equator in the central part of Africa on the west coast between Congo, Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea. And this is a quite a nice map because it's got the different habitat zones in it. And so you can see um, the Sahara Desert really obviously, and you can see uh, um, the different levels of woodland and forest, and you can see the Congo Basin forests of Central Africa, the darker green, and you can see Gabon is mostly composed of Congo Basin forests, and that is really why it's so famous for birding. Here's just a photo to give of, you know, um, rainforest habitat. And one of the really special things about Gabon's forests is that um, although it's continuous in places, in other places, it's, it's, it's patchy with patches of grassland in between. This happens um, in the southeast on a very big plateau, um, the Bateke Plateau. It happens in the central areas around Lope, and it happens on the coast where the forest comes down to the sea, but it's also patchy with these grassland, patch, with these grassland patches. They call the savanna, but it's often really very much forest and then grassland. And this combination of two habitats is really one of the things that makes Gabon special because it allows forest birds to firstly be seen because they're, they're gaps in the forest, but also to utilize some of that open habitat nearby. And this is a typical forest interior shot to give you some sort of idea what these, these types of forests are like inside. Gabon's also really famous because a few years ago, um, there was a mega transect that was walked across it and the president famously uh, declared I think 13 new national parks and Gabon has a lot of very good press around these parks um, and has become quite well known for some of the mammals that you get in the parks such as gorillas, forest elephants, um, mandrels um, and on the coast on the southwest coast you know pepos that you know come into the sea and elephants as well and so this that gives you an idea of where those parks are and I'm going to go through some of these um, these areas which are really good for birding. So um, here's a, a sort of satellite image of Gabon. Um, I've actually just quickly stolen this from the Birding Africa leaflet for a tour that we run but it's quite convenient because it shows you what we think are the best birding areas um, and in a reasonably short amount of time I can give you a sense for where these are and what some of the special birds are there to help you sort of think and plan about the trips. So you can see the capital there, Libreville, in the top, in the um, th the top left, just south of Equatorial Guinea, um, Lope, Makoku, 
Leconi in France will in, and the Umbo in Luango area. I'll go through each of these areas separately and just give you a few examples of some of the, the really interesting birds. So the first area that I, that I wanted to talk about is the area, in fact, I'm gonna go back very briefly to show you in the very top Northeast there, Makoku and Ipasa. This is an area um, near the town of Makoku where there's Ipasa National Park. Um, and uh, sorry, Evindo National Park, uh, which has the Apasa Research Station in it. And it's a really special, very, very diverse bit of Central African forest, one of the better places anywhere in Africa to do forest birding. It's been a research center there for very many years and quite a lot of research on Central African forest birds has been done there. And it is a remarkable place that, to explore. There's quite a diversity of birds there. It would be far too much to list them all, amazing things like spot-breasted ibis fly over in the evenings and yellow-throated cuckoos can be found along the roads. Um, but I thought I would just showcase a few of the really nice birds seen on, on the last tour that Jonathan and Paul photographed. Um, we have things like Bates's nightjar, which you get along the river there. And remarkable find was a grey ground thrush seen here um, roosting at night. Uh, again, a bird very, very few people have ever seen, and it's just really amazing to have, you know, chance encounters in this type of forest. It's all, also a really place for some really difficult skulking birds that are um, very secretive. Um, in particular, it has two species of guinea fowl that are often very hard to see, even there, but especially hard to see elsewhere. Um, plume guinea fowl on the right, with sort of very outrageous um, gray head and those funny sort of pr plumes sticking up here crossing a forest trail. And then of course, the sort of incomparable black guinea fowl dashing across there on the left with its completely naked, bright pink red head um, and cocktail, a very difficult bird to see, extremely secretive, much more easy to hear calling from the depths of the forest. But, some of the forest trails and roads that have been cut through in this area are some of the best places in Africa to look for these species. And then I'm now going to go take us down to the south, southeast. So look down there on the border, you can see near Franceville, there's a town called Leconi. And you can see actually on the satellite image that the forest becomes more limited there, that you have a lot of grassland coming into that forest. And this is what makes the area so special, really is that there's these forest patches, but then these grasslands next door, which have really fantastic birds. Birds that um, South Africans often don't know too much about, but things like Congo moorchat, which are in these open grassy shrubby savannas. Black-headed bee eater is a bird that um, is found more in the forest, um, but then comes to the forest edge in order to nest in its sort of tunnels in the ground. Really quite a scarce bird, but really beautiful and spectacular. But Central African forest species. Kaban is the place to look for black-headed bee eater, which must be one of the most sought after of all the bee eaters. Looking a little bit like our gorgeous bushrike, um, you know, uh, is, um, this very closely related species. Um, and again, notice the difference between our gorgeous and, and this species with it's sort of all green, you know, instead of having far, far more yellow. Another um, bird of this area, which you get in the woodlands, in the shrubby uh, wooded savannas of where the grassland meets the forest, is the black collared bulbul, also known as the Neolestes. Neo and um, it goes from here all the way down to Zambia. Um, quite a special, um, quite a special species. Often, you know, quite an alluring species. Um, with a very interesting call as well. So now we're going to go from the 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 Batekia Plateau of Lakoni, and we're going to head more into the forest to Lope, which is um, Lope National Park, which is in the central part of the country, one of the best places to see um, mandrel in the world. And it's a really good place for a variety of Central African forest species. Um, you know, such as Red Bull Helmet Shrike and um, African Dwarf Kingfisher. 
And one of the specials there is, is a bird that is um, found in these sort of sort of wetland, sh shrubby, sedgy areas sort of in the forest where the forest is a bit more open. And it's called the, it's very, it's related to, you know, the white and scrub warbler, the little rush warbler. And this is sort of Central African, Central West Africa's version, which is the jar, um, jar river scrub warbler. Can be quite hard to see, quite secretive, also with very distinctive call. And Lope is probably the best place to see this. Some of the, the um, rivers coming together in Lope often have these very sort of shallow soiled um, areas around them. Um, and it's one of the areas where you get Forbes' plover. Looks at a glance like a three banded plover, but Forbes with its all dark head is, is a Central African species that moves around um, between these different areas, can occur all the way from Northwestern Zambia up through these Central African regions. And the area around Lope is also a really, um, a really great area to see, um, you know, violet-tailed sunbird, definite one to see. So we, we've now talked about Lope uh, and the area that I wanted to introduce you to at the very end is kind of one of the most special areas in Gabon, the area around Luwango, most famous for the hippos and elephants that, that can that sometimes come to the sea which also has lots of humpback whales as well. The same humpback whales that migrate here across Cape Town end up in this area. Uh, and it's also a very special area for the river martens, which, which breed there. And so what it's like is that you have these wonderful forests that come down to the sea, but then in between them, huge grassland patches and, um, and, big, big sort of black water rivers that sort of come and flow slowly through these areas with like lots of twists and turns and overhanging vegetation. And because of this, it's a fantastic area to look for these sort of lowland forest um, riverine species. One of the ones that as Southern Africans be familiar with is Pearl's Fishing Owl. If you look at the map of the distribution of Pearl's Fishing Owl, you can see that it's found very widely across Africa. You know, um, from our more northern areas all the way through um, Botswana, Zambia, and then you can see how this, but this part of Gabon is one of those places that you might, you might in fact see the species. But you also, in addition to pearls fishing owl, even on the same rivers, you can get vermiculated fishing owl. Quite a different looking bird here. Um, two photos from the last tour. Um, really quite a bit smaller, quite, quite a stunning species with, the, with these very, very delicate markings. And you can see that Gabon is probably the best place to find them. They've been discovered in Northwestern Zambia, but these waterways in Gabon are probably the best place ever, ever to find vermiculate fishing owl. One of my favorite species in Africa, the white crested tiger bittern. Um, you can see it there just at dawn perched on a, on a riverine tree. You can actually see the white crest raised if you look really carefully. It's not, it's not a bl black crest that's missing. It's actually, there's actually white in that photograph there. Um, I really like this, it's a real sense of the mood of this really secretive species that's really nocturnal and feeds very much on the edge of these really big tropical forested rivers, hard to see, like a white back night here and really hard to see because it feeds, you know, nocturnally on the edges and then in the day it roots completely out of sight. But sometimes if you're out really early um, and you get a little bit lucky, you might um, find one still out and about. And um, the details on the species, as you can see, um, you can see why it's called the tiger bitten or tiger heron, this wonderful striping and massive bill. It's a really, really beautiful species, not guaranteed by any stretch of the imagination, but a wonderful bird to have a chance to see in these areas. Another bird which is really important in, in these areas is, is the rosy bee eater. Uh, and one of the reasons it's important is it, is it highlights one of, this, one of the sort of migrations that we get in this area. And that is that in these open grassland areas close to the sea, it's possible to burrow into the soil because it's quite sandy. And so, Rosy bee eaters that might disperse widely across the Central African forest 
would come to a safe area where they can burrow underground in order to nest. And so they do that by coming to the Gabon coast, excavating tunnels in these open patches close to the sea, um, between the forest and the sea, often in their hundreds and thousands. And one of the reasons this is so important is because there's another species that often takes over their colonies when the rosy beaters move and find another colony. And that is perhaps um, Gabon's most famous bird, um, the African river martin. Um, it's a very enigmatic species. Um, we sort of understand more about its movements, um, you know, in recent times, but it seems to it seems to disperse very widely across the Congo Basin, but then when it wants to breed, it comes to the Gabon coast and it finds these old rosy bee eater colonies and it re sort of excavates the holes and then makes its own holes as well. Um, and then they can come in quite big numbers in, in to breed there. And it's a really unbelievable species. And if you get to the area when they sort of arrive in around September, August, September, October, around that time, and you can see them coming and flying in these fantastic flocks, courting and singing. And um, uh, you can see digging in the soil and doing all sorts of displays. And it really is, um, it's just a remarkable species. Um, uh, and it's, it's something, um, it really is the experience of, of being nearby these birds when then and watching this, their displays and seeing how they're breeding in the colony and what they're up to in their behavior. And just thinking about where you are and how this relates to the whole Central African forest zone and this internal migration of this bird. It's really kind of one of the great joys of birding in Africa and a real highlight. And it's something that, you know, we should all try and get to one day. So thank you very much. I mean, that's my introduction to the birds of Gabon. And um, if um, yeah, anybody's any further questions, they're welcome to ask me. And yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much to Dylan, Daniel and Callan for your wonderful presentations. Africa is truly a birder's paradise. Do go have a look at the exhibition booths to find out more about birding eco tours, rock jumper birding, and birding Africa's trips into Africa and around the world. We have a short break in the program now to allow you to explore the virtual platform. Make sure to place your bids on the many items within our silent auction and to visit our exhibitor and sponsor booths. You can also partake in our bird search game. All of these functions can be found on the left-hand side menu on the platform. If you cannot see this menu, look for the three lines in the top left corner and click this to open the menu. See you back at 2.30 for more live interviews with special guests on Feeder One or an introduction to the newly launched Go Birding platform on Feeder Two.